We're here today to talk about Russia, the world's outlaw state, question mark, a big question mark. And, and it's one that's very interesting. I've had a, the pleasure of interview um, many leading Russian national security and political leaders uh, over the years. And I used to work when I was a you know, young pup at the RAND Corporation in what was then called the RAND UCLA Center for the Study of Soviet International Behavior. And of course, the Soviets aren't around anymore. But I will ask kind of, well, maybe they're back, you know? And we'll come to Corey for a minute uh, in a minute. But let me introduce you uh, to our wonderful, wonderful panel. Um, just to my far right, we have Andrew Weiss. Andrew is Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie endowment for international peace, but he's much cooler than that in, in, in the rest of him. Uh, he was, prior to that, he was director of Rand Corporation Center for Russia and Eurasia, so probably the uh, uh, predecessor, or the uh, antecedent of, of where I was many years ago. And he served as the director for Russian, Ukrainian, Eurasian Affairs on the National Security St Council staff, as a member of the State Department's policy staff. Knows Russia big time, like everybody up here will know Russia big time. Uh, and then we have Evelyn Farkas. Many of you will recognize her. She's kind of the latest MSNBC diva uh, on national security <laughs> issues. <laughs> Really wonderful, but importantly, from 2002 out to 2015, she was Deputy <clears throat> Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, um, and has had just a very fond and wonderful time in dealing with the Russians. So we'd love to hear a lot about that, uh, Evelyn. And to my left, we have Corey. I don't have yeah. anything against Russians. No, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're, well, we, I, this is a 360-degree <laughs> discussion, so we'll, we'll get all corners. Corey Shockey, just to my left, is Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, double I, double S. Anybody at a, kind of a national security wonk? Like double I, double S is sort of like the Masons of national security, you know? <laughs> they have lots of secret handshakes. They've got the best conferences sure. in the world. I mean, it's a real honor to have Corey with us. And, and she was a distinguished research fellow at the Hoover Institution, of course, a regular on just about every TV network. <clears throat> she was an editor uh, with an unknown guy whose relationship, uh, editor, editorial relationship with her really launched his career. She edited with Jim Mattis, uh, Warriors and Citizens, American Views of Our Military. So glad you helped give him a boost. Um, of course, Jim is now Secretary of Defense. But she's worked in so many different national security positions uh, in the White House, in the, sta in the, state, in, in the national security uh, infrastructure. So, Girl, can't thank Hold you. a job as well. Right, yeah, no, that's not true. <laughs> really formidable. Uh, one of the most knowledgeable, most interesting uh, experts in national security that I've had the pleasure of knowing. Peter Wittig. Um, Ambassador Peter Wittig uh, has for uh, nine years uh, been the ambassador of Germany to the United States and to the United Nations. He's now the outgoing ambassador. You're, this is probably the last time you're going to see him uh, here as, as you, know, you, you know, with his American accent. Uh, he's about to take on a British accent because he's going to the Court of St. James uh, in, in just a couple of days to become Germany's new ambassador of the United Kingdom. So Peter, thanks so much for joining us. So great panel. Give him a round of applause because I'm going to make him work hard. Um, <laughs> So, Corey, let me just start out. You know, I, I, I um, as someone who's been watching Russia for uh, a long time, and Russia is always complicated. There's always, you know, both times where we've engaged Russia, uh, times where we have to had conflict with her. But the kind of question we're asking today is a very fundamental, a fundamentally different one, of whether or not Russia has stepped forward and has become. A, a, a criminal state in a way that we haven't seen. We've seen in James Bond films and dreamt about them. I was taken uh, with a guy on stage yesterday said we, 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 in our art, in our dreams, we see our tomorrow. So to some degree, I'm wondering if, if we're now dreaming of a very different kind of James Bond criminal state. And I want to read to you something in 2007 that Putin said. Uh, this was directly what, uh, quoted from Putin. Only two decades ago, the world was ideologically and economically split, and its security was provided by the massive strategic potential of two superpowers. But that order has been replaced by a unipolar world dominated only by America. It is the world of one master and one sovereign. When he said this, you could sort of feel him seething. And I'm just interested in how you see Frame Russia today, how you see its character, and what has driven that character. So like Evelyn, I would make a distinction between the Kremlin and Russians, um, not only because I, I genuinely believe there is a distinction, that is that President Putin and the people around him are essentially a mafia state. Um, and, therefore, and you don't say those words lightly, right? No, and therefore yeah. can't bear the scrutiny of exposure, um, including to their own people. So, so yes, I think they're evil. Yes, I think they're corrupt. Yes, I think they are profoundly nostalgic for the days when Russia mattered. Because if you look at the 
at the data on Russia, right? The, the three statistics that for me are most meaningful, GDP per capita in Russia in 1990 was $3,800, right? Uh, in 2014, it was $15,000. And now it's back down to $7,800. So, so the choices that Putin made, he, the, the, the rise of the oligarchs, the privatization of things into hands that were politically trustworthy or penalized hugely Magnitsky and company if they were not. Mm -hmm. So yes, what we have seen is a Russia yearning for the days in which it was powerful and it is manifestly not powerful now. And so they're playing a spoiler game. They are, they are taking asymmetric attacks on strong, vibrant societies in order to try and cultivate um, disbelief that there is anything different and better about the West than about Russia. And, and we need to joyously hold hands and refute that. Andrew, where does Corey get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, right. take his view rather than mine. He's a genuine Russia expert. I think it's a mistake to use economic determinism to talk about Russia. Because if you look at the indicators that Corey's citing, Russia on paper looks like a weaker country. It clearly has a smaller economy, smaller military. But it has a disproportionate desire to use its tools to do things that shake up the international but system made, I mean, that it feels is disadvantageous. What made it that way? I mean, one of the things, when I go to Moscow and I, I interviewed a guy named Sergei Karaganov recently, there's a very different narrative over there. I mean, he's a pretty decent guy. I mean, he did come up with what, what's called the Karaganov Doctrine, which if there are a lot of Russian nationals somewhere, you can invade and take over and kind of bring back government. But, but, but Sergei sees American um, arrogance after the period where it came in as the biggest driver of what's happening in Russia today. That the humiliations that the Russian people and the Russian government experienced at our hand as they were reorganizing the society is the thing that's really driven uh, Putin to try and position himself as the Ronald Reagan morning in Moscow kind of guy. And, and I'm just wondering if there's not something legitimate in that narrative. There's no doubt that Russia was really weak in the early 1990s and that a lot of things happened that a strong Russia would have opposed. But much of the grievance that you're talking about is what we would call a narrative. Mm. It's something that Putin has used as a way of legitimizing himself and kind of mobilizing support. The real driver of the current crisis that we're in right now is not that set of grievances. Mm. It's the Russian belief, right or wrong, that in 2011, 2012, it became crystal clear to them with the street demonstrations in Moscow that the Obama administration sought the violent overthrow of that government. So for the Russians, sort of national security establishment, all of the last six or seven years of pushing back, using the asymmetrical tools that Corey was talking about, is a way of sort of defending themselves against what they believe is an existential threat from the United States. And then when opportunities fell on their lap, like the Ukrainian revolution of 2014, where they felt, again, this was ultimately aimed at their national security, they have taken these steps that we find completely, I think rightfully, mm -hmm. unacceptable. And the question for the West, and this is where I think the Western policy response is really now, at a, a moment is there a testing, Western policy response? I think it's, well, how would you it's, it's, I, think it's I think it's right now it's you, in deep crisis yeah. because so what, of what is the Western yeah. policy response? How would you? So it? right now, Donald Trump has thrown all of that playbook that was established after the Russian invasion of Ukraine and basically started to throw it out the window. He's said things in recent weeks questioning whether Crimea was really Russian all along. He's suggested they that it's really important Russian, to get along yeah. with the Russians as if that's an end in itself. When in fact, what the West is really about is a set of shared principles, a set of norms and expectations of what states can and can't do. Putin has routinely transgressed and gone beyond those. It's up to the leaders of the West to show that there's a penalty and that there's a certain set of principles we're all willing to, to really defend. Donald Trump now throws all of that into question. Evelyn, I want you to give us some insight to all the top secret things you know <laughs> about the, and give us a clinical look of whether we really are already at war militarily with the Russians. We sometimes talk about cold wars, hot wars, because what, a lot of what we've seen in the harassment um, of, uh, you know, that, that's going on between, you know, Russian bombers and jets and planes, that there's a whole substructure of things that we don't read about in the New York Times or Post every day that I know you get special access to. So how bad is it? Well, I think we are not at 
war with Russia militarily, that much is obvious. However, we have been attacked by the Russians. Mm -hmm. Our sovereignty has been attacked through their cyber and social right. media and bribery manipulation of our political system. We have them so so called cyber bots sitting on our electrical grid. I mean, sitting there waiting to do what? I mean, so there's a potential for further attacks, and those attacks then start running into this area where asymmetric attacks are not defined right now as military mm. attacks, but if you use cyber weapons to take down the electric grid on the eastern seaboard, well, most people would see that as an attack, a military attack on the United States, or if it happened in, in Canada or in the European states, one in Europe. And what Putin has done all along very cleverly is everything that he's done, all of these attacks that he's conducted, and there's a whole list of things because I can include the you know, extraterritorial assassinations of journalists and other opponents of the Kremlin regime, the Putin regime in, in other countries, Ukraine, um, uh, UK, and possibly it looks like in the US. All of those things that he's done, none of them trigger Article 5 responses mm -hmm. by the United States and its allies. And so he's been very clever to use his relative weakness and our relative weakness, <laughs> which is the need for some kind of threshold, uh, a high enough threshold to warrant collective military response against him. And I can also elaborate a little bit on some of the other points. I think he used grievance politics very effectively mm. to rally the Russian people and to sell many people in Europe in so, particular so, and us. So was there on, a grievance? I think what happened was that Russia lost their empire when mm. the Soviet Union collapsed. They were upset. They didn't want to be treated like any other European country. That's I mean, exactly. France went through that. Right. Austria is still going through that. I lived there for two years in the 90s. Um, you know, there are a whole host of countries still grappling with the loss of empire. And the, for the Russians, it's a process. Unfortunately, a whole bunch of other things happened to make it worse for them. And this crony, you know, corrupt, crony capitalist, not free market economy system came into place, run by these autocratic, corrupt people. They have their, their you know, hands around the Russian state now, you know, around the throat of the Russian people. And their number one objective is to maintain their power. Number two, demonstrate that Russia is great again. That's also linked, though, to staying in power at this point. The initial gambit was, we're going to make your lives better economically. We're going to put more borscht in your bowl, if you will. You know, that's like the equivalent for the turkey in the pot or the chicken in the pot in the US equation. Um, so. Vodka, once please, once they realized that the that corruption was squeezing out all the entrepreneurship <laughs> and the dynamism out of the economy, and that wasn't going to continue, right. meaning your livelihood was not going to continue to increase, a la Corey's earlier comment, then they switched gears and they adopted this nationalist you know, rhetoric and went hardcore with the Nova Russia and this idea that you know, now you have to rescue Russians who are imperiled in other countries. So I can go on and on about this, but I but, think there's a lot right. of kernels of truth here. But And then it gets back to protecting, again, number one objective, keeping him in power. And that's why Syria matters. That's why all these interventions into other states right. like Iraq and other things that you might bring up <laughs> matter to Putin. Long list. Yeah. Long list. So thank you. But I, I, before I get to the ambassador, I want to ask Corey just about this point about you know cyber espionage, cyber war, um, the things we've seen come in. Um, you know our current Secretary of Defense better than anyone else I know. Um, Although Jeff Goldberg thinks he knows him too, so you know it, 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 it could be kind of a rivalry there. I'm not sure, but 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 um, with what what I find staggeringly shocking uh, is that Mike Rogers, the now uh, uh, former head of the National Security Agency, now the new director, we'll hopefully get him here next year to Aspen, Paul Nakasone, have not gotten the combatant orders to respond to these issues. They said a very, uh, it was one of the most shocking moments in a congressional hearing I've ever seen. Usually you go to con congressional hearings and nothing interesting happens. And uh, this time it did. And he said he had not received the orders that he would have needed to mess with Russia. And what, what do you think about that? And what's happening with your, I mean, Jim Mattis could have helped in that. Uh, well, the Secretary of All Defense can speak for his little <laughs> self. Okay. Um, but uh, I would remind you that Mike Nakasone is the guy who, who created the cyber tool that impeded the Iranian nuclear program so That's effectively. called Stuxnet. 
Um, you heard which, it right here. This is a very interesting moment in its own. It's a thing uh, of beauty. Yeah. As an American taxpayer, right. I'm extremely pleased <laughs> and happy we proved that good at our work. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the biggest surprise about the Trump administration is not the things they have prevented, but the things they have permitted. Because mm -hmm. given President Trump's personal views on Russia and on Putin, I actually would have expected Russia policy to be a lot worse than a Trump mm. administration. And there are legitimate reasons not to lean forward on, on offensive cyber tools, mm -hmm. even with the Russians, right? President Obama had that choice and turn, averted his eyes from it right. four times in the run up to the Russian interference in our elections. So, so it's not a crazy thing to do. Mm. I, I personally think it's too cautious. Right. But it's not an outrageous thing to do. And um, Evelyn and I spar about this a fair amount. Yeah. I think the administration has actually done a really good job at imposing sanctions on the Russians. It's true that they didn't carry out everything that the Congress passed, but most administrations don't carry mm -hmm. out everything the Congress passes on sanctions. Right. Um, and the Trump administration um, bounced out 60 Russian diplomats from the United States, more than every other country combined in response mm -hmm. to Russia poisoning with chemical means a, a citizen of Great Britain. So they've actually not done half Street, badly, Streetball. and I would have thought they would be yeah. much worse. Thank you for that, a fair and balanced. Um, Ambassador, I want Look at to- me. I got fair uh, and Yeah, fair and balanced. Ambassador, I want to ask you, because I'm not done with this issue of how we got here to Russia, what some of the roots were. Two years ago here at Aspen, I had the privilege of interviewing Richard Haas, you now President of the Council on Foreign Relations and you know, regular you know, friend of yours in Morning Joe. And, and you had him at the Berliner Salon that you host, and you know Richard quite well. Richard said on this stage that he thought it was a mistake that we didn't bring Russia into NATO, that we didn't find a pathway uh, for Russia into NATO, that it thus created, which he had, he had advocated and written a white paper for uh, in an earlier Republican administration when he was in uh, the State Department at that time, and, and that he said it was led to a dynamic of us versus them, and that there was no, so I'm interested in what you think about that. Did, did, did we have some liability in creating conditions where we're getting back to what feels like Cold War rivalries? Well, I don't know really whether that was a realistic option to take Russia in. I mean, uh, some people flirted with this idea, but early, well, Richard Haas flirted with yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we have seen over the ten years now, over the past ten years, a consistent pattern, a long list of grievances with Russia that affected Europeans directly, starting from occupation of parts of Georgia ten years ago. 2014, annexation of Crimea, a landmark, a threshold decision, basically redrawing the map in Europe, uh, and, and basically the end of the post-Cold War order, mm -hmm. then an involvement in Syria, meddling in our uh, internal affairs, questioning arms control agreements, etc. cetera. Violating uh, you know, arms a, a, control agreements. A new emphasis on uh, nuclear postures, etc. So that's a long list. And the European response was, I would say, twofold. First, um, be strong in defense, stronger than before. Um, you know, the enhanced forward presence, um, stationing soldiers at the uh, Russian border, Germany is part of that. And, but also be more resilient as a society. Um, strengthen our resilience against this hyper, uh, hybrid warfare, against cyber attacks, etc. That's the pressure track. Mm. Sanctions are part of it. But secondly, and this is, I say this from a European perspective, this is equally important, the dialogue track, mm. the um, channels of communication that have to be kept open. Chancellor Merkel was the one who talked hundreds of times to Putin, not as a buddy of bu buddy buddy uh, relationship, mm. but you know, to keep the channels of communication open. Why? First, we have some issues to solve with Russia, be it counterterrorism, be it nuclear non-proliferation, be it Syria, be it Ukraine, be it North Korea, where Russia has a stake. And secondly, I'm worried about um, an unwanted, unintended military 
escalation that nobody wants. Mm. But that is a real danger. And so we need military to military contacts and we need contacts of the leadership. So don't forget that dialogue track, that channel of communication track. And from a Euro last sense, from a European perspective, um, we are neighbors. Geography matters. We are neighbors. We don't want to bring Russia down to, down to its knees. Russia um, will be more nationalistic, more chauvinistic if we weaken it. So we have to live with that giant in our neighborhood. And, and th that's why we have to have a balanced, um, consistent Russia policy. I don't see that happening all the time here. Corey wants to jump in here, and, and I'm going to let that happen. But if I were to read the transcript of Corey's comments a moment ago, I would think, and I would, I'm putting words in your mouth, think that you give the Trump administration basically about a B uh, in its yeah. performance on, on Russia. You probably give it a D or F. No, but I, but what, well, do you, what do you give? What, what does Germany give Donald Trump? I refuse. I'm still a diplomat. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to, my to, to so London. I'm on the way out. I want to stamp my little cloven hoof about yeah. this Russia and yeah. NATO business. Right. Because if Russia would behave the way a NATO member behaves, right. which is commit not to change national boundaries by violence, mm -hmm. to commit to cooperative solutions, to meet its obligations under the OSCE, under the seven arms control agreements they freely entered into that mm. they are currently in violation of. Right. Actually, they would have a good case to be a NATO member. And the reason Russia is alienated from NATO is Russia's behavior, not NATO's behavior. Thank you for that. Um, I want to jump into another thing. There was a, um, the fact, we've already talked a little bit about the cyber, but I want to go a little bit different, you know, deeper with, with Andrew, just where it came from. And, and Putin as, as the, the sort of person that, that we see as all things you know, Russian now. And I, I have to tell you that whether it's talking to Bill Browder, uh, who has been, you know, worked with, with Magnitsky uh, and was, has been at Aspen Ideas last year. I don't know if some of you saw Bill Browder often on TV, uh, really is the one that's been pushing the adoption of the Magnitsky ad all over the world, which is to rate human rights violations and others. Bill told me something and when we interviewed him at Aspen about how uh, Vladimir Putin parks his money with oligarchs around the world and, you know, gets 10% or 20% of whatever deals get done and then parks money with various places. And it was very interesting uh, because the, um, what, what was there, let me just read this piece. The, the, the documents in the Panama Papers revealed, because uh, this is a piece in the Atlantic, that Putin's old friend Sergei Roldugin, a cellist and the godfather to Putin's elder daughter, had his name on funds worth some $2 billion. Jesus. It was an implausible fortune for a little known music musician. And the journalist showed that these funds were likely a piggy bank for Putin's inner circle. So the, so the, the, the narrative, at least, that Julia Yaffe, my colleague at The Atlantic, has, is She's that great. the Panama Papers um, were the things that caused Putin the deepest personal embarrassment and angered him, and that the decision to engage in cyber war against the state, to hack John Podesta's email, to go after our democracy per se, was, was a tactical, emotional one. And I'm just interested in whether you think that's a correct narrative, Andrew. No, I don't buy it. I think, I think ultimately that is an excuse. The, the reality here is in 2014, the Russian government believed that the train of coup d'etat, which happened in Ukraine and their right. narrative, the next stop was Moscow. Mm -hmm. And so starting in 2014, the Russian government initiated a series of kind of small bore covert actions to try to undermine unity in the West, to plant wedges between the United States and its European partners, and to create disturbance in the major industrialized democracies. They help foster the populist eruption, which Donald Trump is a great beneficiary of, and we see that populist germ spreading throughout Western Europe as well, and Eastern Europe. The question is, at some point, Russia decided to go to a new level to take what was done for espionage purposes to gather information through cyber techniques and then basically create something new by doxing to mm -hmm. hand over wholesale a large database of information collected by its intelligence operations to embarrass and cause disruption against, uh, basically, 
the US democratic system, to throw our system into chaos, to create this kind of false equivalence of you know, the US democracy is not what it's cracked up to be, the US is shot through with corruption and hypocrisy and double standards, and to sort of send a message both to Russian people that what you, you know, idealized at home, you know, is, is so great, isn't so great after all. All of those steps, in the end, I think, were to make the US less governable and to kind of handicap what they expected to be a Clinton administration coming to office, either to create illegitimacy or to kind of undermine its effectiveness. They exceeded, in some ways, similar to the 9-11 hijackers, well beyond Way their beyond wildest there. expectations. And so we had a US presidential campaign, which by fluke was decided by about 70,000 votes in three or so critical states. And we now have a political crisis, the likes of which has never been experienced in my, my professional lifetime. So we are inward looking, we are coming apart at the seams in terms of our traditional alliance relationships. We have a leader who no longer sees the international order that was created after World War II, that the US is the steward and the underwriter of, as inherently beneficial to the United States. All of those things are huge wins to the Russians. So when you look, you know, set, you know flash forward to a month from now, to the uh, Putin-Trump meeting, which is expected to happen in mid-July, don't get fixated on what are they negotiating and you know, are there gonna be sanctions, you know, quid pro quos and you know, changes to US policy on Ukraine. The big win here is a US in crisis which is no longer a direct threat to the Russian regime. And that is, a, that is a, a reward which just pays off day in, day out and everything else for the Russians is gravy. Thank you that, for that. that I'm gonna file that as a objective. letter to the editor in response to Julia's but can I, piece. But can I say something yeah, that sure. it is possible that he, his actions were, he did have a knee-jerk reaction to those papers because he did believe that the, the Panama Papers and then the Paradise Papers. He thought papers, we were behind it. He did yeah. believe that we were behind it. He did not, he doesn't understand how journalists would work independently and then somehow together. So he, he does see that as part of our attempt to take him down, part of our attempt to force regime change. And it is true that his thinking with regard to Ukraine was absolutely affected by, um, and without getting into sources and methods, but there's a lot of discussion about this by former officials that he was affected by Hillary Clinton's coming out and saying what she said about the Russian parliamentary election, saying that they were essentially um, not legitimate and that, and that he felt that she was in effect challenging him and his hold on power. So let Can me I ask- just add that if his actions could bear public scrutiny, he wouldn't have to have that concern. Let me so just quibble with that for a second. If you go to Moscow, and I mean, I say this as someone who I'm gonna embarrass myself, grew up in Beverly Hills and worked at a hedge fund. What? You go to Moscow and it's embarrassing. So every Russian knows that their leaders are wealthy beyond the wildest imagination of plutocrats mm. in the West. That is not news to the Russian people. And so the idea that you know some papers documenting how much funny business is going on, Russia is an oil producing country that generates hundreds of billions of dollars in profit for its leaders every day of the week. Like that is the nature okay. of the Russian so let me ask socioeconomic reality. Can I add one thing? Yeah. It's also education. It's, I did not have that it's, perspective. It's a okay. neo-fascist system, culture, political system that they have in place in Russia. And that's the danger because I believe that we need to speak out not just about Putin and against Putin, but also against Putinism. Because the same kind of thinking that the Russian people have day to day, like, yeah, they're corrupt, it's the way it is. But how you do know, you My do place that? in the I mean, socioeconomic I, hierarchy is set. I can't do anything about Evelyn, it. Evelyn, how do you do that when you have the trends going on in the United States you have going on? I mean, like, it, you know, I, Well, I, that's I, what I'm obliquely yeah, referring to. Yeah, okay. You know, that it well, can happen anywhere. Good, just want to be clear. So let me, but I want to, before we get, go down that, that route, I want to ask um, Corey and Evelyn and then, and then get back to the ambassador, but, but ask the two of you, why have we been so pathetic in, in not seeing this and responding? You know, I, I mean, when, when you sort of look at this, you just raised Paul Noxoni and Stuxnet. Some of you may remember Alex Gibney's film Zero Day. So this is, if you haven't seen it, watch it, but it's about uh, the, the U.S.-Israeli operation to uh, basically wreck Iran's centrifuges. And it was one of the first state-based applications of malware that went in to destroy a system. It's a fascinating discussion, and no government official 
Corey is not a government official, but has actually admitted that the U.S. and Israeli governments did this. And so, so if you so, haven't yeah. read uh, David Sanger's terrific new Sanger, book yes, exactly. on, saying, yeah. on cyber war, he it. lays it out in great detail. Beautifully, and David was very involved with this film as well. But given that, and given the fact that one of the things that happened at that is that we, essentially the code got everywhere, and people, a state, the, the, the state malware application just skyrocketed, where states all over are now in this business, in part because they mimicked what we did to Iran. And so we saw the capabilities out there. We the saw West out there. our intelligence. So why have be, the United States been so pathetic in responding or seeing this coming? Evelyn? Because I think we, we know that we set an example, we set the rules. And so once we start changing really? the rules, uh other countries will feel that they can follow suit. The, there's another area where this happens, the drone, the drone area. So the envelope is being pushed. Countries would like to, to have their own drones and to have armed drones, and you can see where this could right. eventually go. So in the administration, there were a lot of interagency meetings. What do we do about drones and armed drones, and what's our policy? And then how do we get that policy through international fora to get other countries to adopt it? So you know, norms matter. They really matter. We talked earlier about the strikes against Syria, those pinpoint strikes that the Trump administration undertook to demonstrate that you cannot use weapons of mass destruction against innocent civilians. Mm -hmm. It matters when we stand up for those norms. Right. And so I think we are still grappling with how does one, what are the rules for cyber operations, mm -hmm. offensive or defensive? And, and we're not comfortable going farther than we have to for right. obvious reasons because people will start mimicking there's us. A, there's a simple answer on this, which is that when Barack Obama, who's had to make a lot of tough calls throughout his presidency, is confronted with, do you punch back? The reality was the United States has the sharpest rocks in cyberspace, to borrow the line from one of our former cyber operators, but it lives in the glassiest house. And so right. our society is simply right. more digitized and more vulnerable to an escalatory spiral where the Russians could keep imposing just, pain. Just give and us that a, I mean, it'd be nice Preston to see a little Obama. example of where? those rocks. You know, wouldn't, I mean, I'd, I'd so, love to see it, but, but so Corey, I want to come to you. I would have loved to see President mm -hmm. Obama actually use the tools right. of a free society mm -hmm. in the fall of 2016 to admit that three different times the Russians had already penetrated American government right. systems. And here, I, you know, we think about the tools of a free society, we think about our vulnerabilities mm -hmm. all of the time. And we're not leaning into what we're good at as a society. Right, right. And if you look at the way the French presidential candidate Macron handled Russian interference in the French elections, mm -hmm. that's the model of what President Obama should have done in the fall of 2016, which is trust that, that in a democracy, free people can make sensible judgments and information is our friend. And, and the right. German government so, threatened. Right. So the German, let's get back to the German yeah. government here. Um, Ambassador Wittig, you have your own intelligence service. You spy, you watch, you watch spy on the Russians, you see things happen, you see you know, the killings in, in England. We had the uh, founder and creator of Russian television killed in the DuPont Hotel uh, in Washington, D.C. Things were growing. You, you just doc, you know, went through a nice inventory of Russia's muscle in the world and various things. As you've watched this stuff, and I want to ask you a question about the strategic class in Washington, the Russian ambassador, Michael Flynn, some of the people, Paul Manafort, who've gotten wrapped up in the, I mean, these are all people that we know. Did you see this g going to a boil before any of us did? And didn't well, tell I'm, us. I don't have a crystal ball here. But you do, I'm not you do, clairvoyant, yeah. but what I can tell you as an observer from the outside, I see that the U.S. Russia uh, policy is determined by domestic politics. It's the 2016 election that turned Democrats into Russia hawks, and it's the meddling, the Russian meddling into the domestic affairs of the U.S. that is to a large extent determining. Um, uh, the policy of this administration and, and of the Obama administration towards Russia. I don't know whether this is a wise prism through which you have to look at Russia. That's I would prefer... Very delicately and diplomatic. I, I would, um, I, I would uh, rather prefer if we would look at the order and the challenge that Russia poses to our common Western order. 
we have to, I think, act in unison. We as the West have to act in unison, in solidarity vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Right. And we're not doing that. One day we hear we need more sanctions um, against Russia. I would say um, parts of Washington are trigger happy when it comes to sanctions. And we are, you know, some protagonists are losing focus what sanctions should do. They should change the behavior. They should not just punish. They have a purpose. They are not an end in itself. So one day it's more sanctions. The next day is a suggestion that we should uh, you know, reinvent the G8 instead of the G7. There's no consistency You were surprised here. by that, I think. So yeah. if, Everybody if was we surprised do, by that. If we're not acting in unison, yeah. I mean, you know, the Western, so, so we, just, will not, uh, we will not be able to, um, you know, have the upper hand. Right. Uh, so just before I would go to the audience, because I want to go to all of you for your questions, Peter, let me, let me just drill in. So acting in unison, feeling as if we are, have a, a shared purpose, shared challenges in the world to work together. Um, when I know this from one of your colleagues whom I can't identify, that when Donald Trump sat across from Angela Merkel and in one of their, their early meetings. You know more than I. Uh, <laughs> he took I out there. a paper and pen. <laughs> he took out a paper and pen and he wrote uh, an invoice to Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. handed her a piece of paper and said, you owe us $2 trillion. And he said, but I'm willing to deal. We can, we can you know, work it down. And I mean, and, and my understanding is that her face was completely ashen. You can wash dishes. <laughs> and, and I'm just, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the health of US-German relations? <laughs> um, Mr. Serving Ambassador. You know, metrics uh, are, are not the right <laughs> measurement here. We have um, divergences of views. Um, we are in a difficult phase in transatlantic relations. Uh, that, that is no secret. We have trade issues. Um, we have um, issues how to deal with Russia. Um, uh, we have the burden sharing issue, which is a legitimate issue from an American and also from a German perspective. Uh, we see uh, with apprehension uh, that this order that um, we cherished is in danger to um, unravel. Um, so it is a very challenging phase of our transatlantic relations. Tori? I, I, let me, let, let, let me um, add, um, I'm optimistic. Uh, we, ha we have a strong base of, of German-American relations, um, and um, I think we can overcome this, but uh, we have um, a difficult chapter right now. Do you, Tori? I, too, think we can overcome this, uh, but I... What's your scale of 1 to 10, health of U.S.-German relations? I would give it a 3. Wow. I actually, I can't think of a time, even during the run-up to the Iraq War in 2003, when relations were this bad with the German government. Because That's what, what I call a tweetable moment. What President Trump is calling into question isn't a particular policy, but the fundament of Western cooperation and the basic bargain of the last 70 years. I'd agree with that, although we had some pretty bad times you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, mm -hmm. um, certainly the run-up to um, the Pershings, et cetera. I think what's more important to focus on is that there is now a fight for the international order and a struggle between democracy and autocracy. Mm -hmm. And we have to be really clear about what side we're on. Unfortunately, our president doesn't fully seem to understand what's at stake or he doesn't care. I, I, I don't want to go to the second one because, because the international order is what has kept America safe and prosperous. And we didn't do it because we were benevolent. It was self-interested. We were selfish in setting up the system, but we happened to be able to do it in a way where it wasn't zero sum, meaning everyone won something. We won the most, sure, but it worked for everyone. Andrew, quick thoughts before I go to the audience. I think the, the collapse of U.S.-German relations is probably the biggest unspoken tragedy of the last year and a half of the Trump administration. The relentless needling of the chancellor, the fixation on kind of Breitbart-type rhetoric about immigration and about uh, the, the, the decadence of the EU, all of this stuff is the nativist, nationalist side of Trump. It doesn't get enough attention when it's applied to the U.S.-German equation. 
you can't have an effective U.S. strategy towards Russia without German cooperation and buy-in, and we basically sawed that leg off the table. You know, I, I asked that question purposely because when you look at it, if you were to ask yourself at the beginning, you know, your point on autocracy, David Frum had... Uh, you know, a cover story in the Atlantic called "How to Build an Autocracy" yes. with you know who on the cover. Yes. But but I think the broader question is: if you were to have written an inventory of what strategic objectives Vladimir Putin had, and I have to tell you, Fiona Hill, one of the most brilliant people on Russia and Vladimir Putin, uh, is he spoke here at Aspen uh, two years ago, three years ago. I interviewed her about Vladimir. Really, one of the most knowledgeable people next to Angela Stent on Russia and and uh, Putin now worked for Donald Trump, works in that administration, so it's not like they didn't have somebody to help them understand these things. But you're, you know, what I asked the question about U.S.-German issues and what's happening, because it's very high on Vladimir Putin's list of objectives to see this split happen. So right. I just want to make that point. Right. Um, let me go to all of you. We've got, boy, people right in the audience all over. Uh, we're going to do fast questions and fast answers, okay? And okay, we'll be promise. sure to get it. So right here in the middle. Uh, and Love you, that you guys are sharing Are you guys blanket, together? Are you sharing the same question? Sharing the blankets, yeah. and Tell us who you are. Jacques. Jacques, great. Yes. Um, to me, it's really obvious that this administration is totally playing into Putin's agenda. Mm. And uh, driving a wedge between us and NATO is, Four question. is where it, what do you guys think about that? Yes, so, you're right. There, next question right here. There we go. Uh, my question is no, the totally elephant in the room. It's also very specific because you guys are experts and we're just regular Aspen mm -hmm. residents. Mm -hmm. Is um, how much do we know about how Russia interfered with the, uh, the four states that caused the election to turn to Trump? I've read so many different articles. I can't seem to get a final view on like, we know that they did Facebook. We know that they did this kind of permanent, you know, uh, making people's opinion the nativism. But what did they do in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania? Uh, Michigan, etc. So there are 21 American states who had their uh, voter registration um, tested by Russian intelligence. And quite a number of those states were actually compromised in the process. And those four states were among those 21 states. But as American citizens out there, as I assume you folks mostly are, um, you should be concerned in a different way because it took an awful long time for us to know that there were 21 states, which states those were, and on top of it, those states took a very long time. There's a famous hearing that Mark Warner and Richard Burr, Senator Burr and Senator Warner <coughs> did with a staff member of the Department of Homeland Security where this began to roll out. And at the time, John Kelly, now Chief of Staff, then Secretary of Homeland Security, saw this as classified material that shouldn't be discussed in public. So that's a very interesting question. When you have a penetration of an election system, at what point does this need to be transparent? Do people need to know about it and need point. to take strategies because but it was not out there. At every point, yeah. on top of information that, information is you, our friend. On top of that, you also had the Information Research Agency, that in, in organization the that's Russian, been yeah. now served with indictments by Robert, um, Mueller, yeah. Robert Mueller, conducting through Facebook and other social media, Twitter, et cetera, targeting, buying ads literally to target people specifically in those swing states, and we know that they tailored those ads towards people. Again, more, of, more will come out as a result of the Mueller investigations. Right here, this gentleman, the gentleman in blue, next to the gentleman in blue. Thank there you, Steve. Go. Yes. Andrew mentioned the upcoming meeting between President Trump and- And tell us who you are, we, I know, but my name is do Rupert. some advertising. <laughs> my name is Rupert. I run a public radio program called 1A. Um, I'd like to know what message you think America should be taking to the Kremlin. Hmm. I'm going to give this to Peter. What message should we be taking? To well, first of all, I think um, a summit between Putin and Trump is not a bad thing. It is an anomaly, really, that the two or two leading powers in the world are not on speaking terms on a presidential level. So first of all, it's a good thing. Now, the question is, what is the content? And, and I think there, uh, the hopes cannot be overblown because in one meeting you can only touch on certain things. Mm -hmm. But it's important what will be part of the meeting. Interestingly enough, from what we know, the NATO summit um, will be before the meeting and not after. Mm -hmm. So the president will be bound, in a way, by what the NATO summit says. And we hope that this provides the framework from, uh, for what he discusses with Putin. 
So I think um, certain things should be part of that, like Ukraine, like Syria, Crimea, certain grievances that we have should be part of that summit. But what will come out of that, I think most we can hope for, is the beginning of a process. Andrew? I think just, just the real answer quick, is if I think you play if by you, the rules, we'll help you succeed. Andrew. If you take Donald Trump and all the weirdness out of the equation for a second, we are going to have a competitive and oftentimes adversarial relationship. That's just the reality. The question is, do you manage it well or poorly? There was an incident in February in Syria where a bunch of sort of Russian version of Blackwater military contractors mm -hmm. tested the resolve of US Special Forces, and it led to uh, serious bloodletting. Hundreds, perhaps, of Russian uh, soldiers were killed. The question is, do we avoid incidents like that in the past? Peter alluded to this a minute ago. Or do we just kind of keep tempting fate? I think there's too much danger and too much risk embedded in the US-Russian equation. It's incumbent on our uh, leaders, whether it's Secretary Mattis, President Trump, to kind of manage that problem. There's not going to be a happy moment where Russia disappears. And we should sort of, I think, start banishing this idea that Russia is so either, you know, it's a country that we can put in the corner and we can just kind of ignore it. There's a wonderful moment in Putin's memoir when he describes chasing a rat into a corner as a kid and the rat jumps on it. And he said he learned at that point, don't corner a rat. I think that's largely true when it comes to Putin as well. E Evelyn, are you for a Putin-Trump dance I, on I, July 15th? I, I am it's July 15th, opposed right? to it because yeah. I would love to take Trump out of the equation because I think he doesn't understand, well, I don't think he's helping, let's just put it that way. But to go to the question um, about the message, what message should the US be sending, whether the at a message, summit or not? Well, okay. So. And certainly I believe we should have dialogue with right. the Russians, especially on arms control issues and strategic stability issues which are related to arms control. And Russia, and Russia does have legitimate grievances and fears when it comes to the military balance, right. nuclear and conventional. So I, I do think we need to have conversations with them because what happens is they jump to the asymmetric, which is very dangerous, and they miscalculate how we and our NATO allies would respond. So that's one thing we should tell the Russians. So if Putin's going to meet go. with Trump, he should tell them, your doctrine is dangerous. What you're doing, all this asymmetric methodology, methodology is dangerous. Stop occupying countries, because that's the only way you're going to get sanctions lifted. Stop um, aiding and abetting the killing of innocent civilians in Syria. Right. And if you meddle in our elections, there will be further proportionate responses by the United States. So Trump should actually threaten and make him aware of what our very clear, firm perspective is Probability on. Probability of that outcome? Good, good answer, right here, yeah. Hi. Hi, Joni Liebeck. What has to exist for us to put a spotlight on, um, on, the, on the Arctic, where they say the Russians have troops like 100,000 uh, men, and uh, Canada, the US, Scandinavia, we have, you know, very few, maybe okay. a thousand, Thank two you. thousand. Quick thoughts on Arctic. Andrew, I'm going to give you the Ratify Arctic. Ratify the law of the sea treaty. So, yes, th yeah. this is key. So okay. I'm taking the mic back. Go ahead, Corey. Ratify the law of the sea treaty, which the United States is not only compliant with, but enforces on others, and yet we have not ratified, which it sets the rules for engagement in places like the Arctic in ways that are beneficial to us and our allies, and we could have a lot more standing in arguing that the Russians and the Chinese, for that matter, are in violation of them. Right up here in front. Uh, Andrew, did you want to? No, I'm happy to okay, keep going. OK, great. Let's keep going. Uh, Bruce. Um, Bruce McGavar, um, I find it dangerous that the Europeans haven't spent more on their defense. And given that, when do you think uh, Putin's going to Proceed. He knows that. So what do you think his next territorial move is and where? Uh, Ambassador Whitting, what's, hmm. your, what's your game plan? Well, Why aren't you guys doing more? I mean, seriously. We are doing more. I mean, there was a NATO decision in 2014 and 2016 after the Crimea and the Ukrainian conflict arose. As, as I said before, it was a watershed moment in the history of Europe to a move towards a 2% goal, 2% of the GDP within a 10-year time span, sort of incrementally. And at the time, only two or three countries were spending 2%, and we were not among them. And now we are trying our level best to reach that 2% goal. We won't reach it um, uh, probably in two, 2024, but we will be close. Um, that is an important um, 
ingredient of countering uh, Russia's new assertiveness. And I think um, it's a legitimate issue to remind the Europeans that right. they have to do more uh, um, on their security. And Obama spoke about it. Trump speaks about it. Is Moldova next? No, no. So, so I mean, I want to just uh, uh, say something about Corey. Corey has written more about this subject than any human being alive. So I just wanted to give her a, a, an opportunity. I promise I'll be short. Yeah. No, no, it is. But I mean, you have written. I mean, I want to give you credit. So for, European is, defense expenditure has only gone up by four percent since Russia invaded Crimea, not to four percent of GDP. But their level of scaredness since <laughs> Russia violated territorial integrity for the first time since 1945 is four percent. That's not anywhere near good enough. But I do not believe the Russians will actually invade a country in Europe because European militaries, underfunded as they are, could still win this war very easily. The Polish military could do it. The Dutch can do it. Even the Germans can do it. <laughs> That's great. Yes, we know something right about yeah. the military, I tell Hi. Hello, Chris Ryerson, Aspen Local. Quick question is that, well, actually, maybe not quick, I've only heard reasons, as far as that makes sense to me, why we should not be, uh, the United States should not be friendly with Russia in the ways it has been in the past few years. Are there any reasons at all that the U.S. can gain as a, as a country from being friendly with the ways it has been with Russia? It's a great question. Not under Vladimir Putin. I disagree. I, I disagree. I really I disagree, disagree too. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope you heard embedded in my comments, both in reference to Richard Haas and others, that I do sort of think the United States uh, did not play a constructive role in helping to prevent this narrative of hum humiliation coming. One, two, Russia was vital to us in negotiating the Iran deal. Remember the Iran deal? The Iran deal used to stand as, you know, as we think about North Korea, we of course don't have anything like an Iran deal in North Korea. Maybe we'll get something, but okay. Russia is a vital strategic I player. Agree. I agree. And I have to tell you, I strongly, I mean, I, I, I uh, appreciate what Evelyn was saying about Russia just becoming another country, but my friends in Moscow and Russia said, we want what you're doing with China. We want a strategic and economic dialogue with you where we're discussing global affairs as a stakeholder on par with you. And the United States did not want that to happen. And, and I got to tell you, that would have been a cheap price to pay in my book right. for but, some of what we're seeing we today. We did give them. We had bi bi presidential commission, a bi-presidential commission established thin, thin, first thin. under Clinton, yeah. then reinvigorated under Obama. And we had all these meetings, and I went to some of these meetings, Jesus, and we talked about counterterrorism, the and questions. they didn't want to cooperate with us. So in theory, yes, we should be working together. And in theory, Russia should be working closer with Europe right. and NATO, because China is their mid to long term concern. Uh, just so real quick, the man in white and the lady in white. I want to hear Michael's answer yeah, to that. Ahead. Just, just yeah. real quick on this. Andrew. The, uh, and Andrew. 10 seconds. The U.S. and Russia are the world's two largest nuclear weapon states. They right. have special responsibilities to ensure and safeguard the arms control regime that is now at danger of collapse, doesn't collapse entirely. They have special responsibilities to ensure that certain countries like Iran and North Korea mm -hmm. don't pose a significant danger beyond what they already are doing. Uh, to undermine international security. So there are ways to cooperate even with a country like Russia. And the question is, do you have the ability to mix the forceful, the defensive, the resilience pieces of the policy with the cooperative piece? So far, Donald Trump is really putting the emphasis entirely on the cooperative piece, and that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. And I agree with that. My point is just that fundamentally, we have to be very clear-eyed about what Putin wants. Right here, sir. Hi, Patrick Sagal, local. Aspenite. Could you talk more about China and Russia's relationship? Xi Jinping just gave uh, Vladimir Putin, his best friend, the uh, first friendship award, which was a big piece of bling of gold. <laughs> and uh, the Chinese don't do that uh, lightly. So um, what's the relationship between China those and the China and Russia future? finally going to love each other? Corey? So I love that you asked that question. The great difference between the United States and the the China's and the Russia's of the world is that traditionally we have played team sports, mm. right? That is our strength. If you want to fight a trade war against China, you actually ought to get your arms around America's European allies, because that's the way to actually win that war. Um, and so you're right. 
I think that the Chinese are smart enough to understand that this is an enormous asymmetric advantage that the United States has, and that they ought to be trying to pick up support where they can get it. My institute runs a big meeting of defense ministers in Singapore every year. We had it a couple of, year, a couple of months ago. Uh, 26 defense ministers showed up, and none of them favored what China is doing. And so the Chinese are, they're smart, they're cagey, they're trying to dig their way out of the ditch their policies have dug them into. And we ought to be a lot more worried about other countries learning to do what we do well at a time where President Trump is burning like a wildfire through America's goodwill with our Peter, allies. Peter, thoughts on this? Can't, can't add anything more, but um, yeah. Evelyn? Well, I would just say that Putin and Xi need one another. They, they're very tactical in their use for one another. Putin needs Xi to demonstrate to the West that he doesn't need the West, he doesn't need Europe, and to, to make him seem like he has other options. The Chinese are very clever and they understand they need Russia because they don't want a spoiler in their backyard on their border. They know the long game is they're going to eat Russia's lunch. The Russians, if you have put enough vodka in them, you know, um, at the mili in, even in the military world will admit that yes, China is their concern and they're watching their strategic nuclear arsenal, for example. But the Chinese know full well that conventionally and certainly in a nuclear realm, Russia, they don't want to mess with Russia. Andrew, quick on. Putin has willfully become China's junior partner on most diplomatic issues. Economically, politically, militarily, the trend lines are all unfavorable. But he's looking for alternatives. He feels that basically the Western alternative is now closed off. This is as good a deal as he's going to get. As chair of this, I'm going to add my own view here, which is you know, about a dozen or so years ago, I was in Beijing and invited to meet the equivalent of the policy planning staff of Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I said, great, I'm going to finally uh, ask the Chinese what their grand strategy in the world is. Um, and, and they sort of jokingly said, our grand strategy is try to you know, keep Americans distracted in small Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and, and, and it's a pretty good strategy, by I, I want to say that, that when you think about it, when you raise this question, because China is mammoth, when you think about power, it's like the stock market. Uh, power is a function of future expectations. And when you look at Russia, you look at China, it's very clear uh, China is an extraordinary player. And so what I worry about this is a duplicitous hand, a sideways hand. We, we're talking somewhat earnestly about what countries and leaders are doing. I worry what they're doing in the side sideways area of trying to create circumstances that distract us, that draw us away, that throw us off our game. And I think when you look at those things, I think, I think Xi Jinping is you know, flirting with Putin, not for big strategic reasons, but just to make us talk about it right here. So uh, just something, I want to go right here. Yes. Hi, um, I, I'm Heidi Scholz. I just had a question, kind of a follow-up on the Chinese relationship with Russia, but more the Iran relationship with Russia. And now that we've backed out of the nuclear right. deal, what do you think, how do you think Russia is going to either exploit that relationship or do you think that, how do you think that relationship is going to uh, grow I, or just- That's a great question. Can I start with, oh, go ahead, Peter. I have something to say yeah. on it. We, we, we Europeans think it was a big mistake of um, the US to leave the Iran deal. And it gives Russia um, a pathway into, an even more pathway into the Middle East. I mean, if you look at the way Russia has expanded its influence, uh, where they were strong as Soviet Union, it's um, rather impressive. They go back to um, Egypt. They have gone back uh, to Libya. Um, they are in Syria, firmly embedded. And if you give them a pathway now to go into Iran, um, that, that's a, um, a geopolitical um, fact that is uh, really um, against our interests. So um, it underlines, uh, I say this uh, with a certain uh, degree of sadness, it, it is, um, uh, uh, corroborates the fact that, that it was a mistake to leave the Iran deal. It gives an upper hand to Russia. Corey? So I think you're right to worry about Iranian-Russian collusion and a series of choices that the Trump administration treated as discreet, I actually think are cumulative. So taking the side of the Saudis and the Emiratis against mm. Qatar, have the Qatari, Turkish, Iranian, Russian 
collaboration, almost every choice we have made has actually fostered that. Right. But I would suggest that there are limits to it. And it looks to me like what is happening in Syria right now is that Iran wants to take credit for saving the Assad government and for creating um, Iranian hegemony around the Middle East. And the Russians actually want credit for saving the Assad regime. And I noticed when the Israelis started making strikes on Iranian positions in South uh, Syria, the Russians permitted it. So I, I think there's the potential for friction there that we ought to be taking up. That's correct. And when the Russians tried to use an airbase in Iran, they tried to make it sound like they would be positioned. They used the airbase and they would be positioned there. And it, this was about a year ago or so. Right. And the, and the Iranians came back right away and publicly said, no, 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 this was a one-time thing. They made it very clear that this is no kind of alliance, no basing, nothing of the, of the sort. And with every day that the, the, the game in Syria becomes less about seizing territory and more about holding it, the air component becomes less important. And that's been the main thrust, although, of course, we have those renegade mercenary guys, not renegade, those mercenary fellows who were sent there by the Kremlin to, to probe us. The, the bottom line is that most of the fighters there are Iranian or Iranian-funded Hezbollah on the ground. And so as the, the game shifts, Russia will lose influence. That's right. another reason why I worry for Israel, because they think somehow we and the Russians will you know, hold the, the, the Iranian feet to the fire when it comes to red lines that they have, uh, or Syrian feet to the fire. Right. I don't know whose feet to the fire. Basically, so that Iran does not permanently occupy Syria or mm -hmm. beef up the capability of the Hezbollah right. on the Israeli Andrew? border. OK. Yeah. My, my final question before we conclude, I want to, you guys have been great. Uh, just two words from you, uh, in, in each of you. Do you think the framing of this discussion is Russia an outlaw state, and should we go back to some form of containment strategy? Yes or no on both? I'm not sure that we benefit from name calling. Yes or no both? I don't think name yeah. calling works. Okay. I think that Russia is too big uh -huh. and too dangerous for us to kind of get the sense of satisfaction that just sort of putting them in the penalty box is an effective policy. We have things we're going to need right. to deal with Russia on and a lot that we're going to need to push back against. Evelyn? We have to call a spade a spade. Russia is no longer a status quo power, so I'm going to have to answer yes to the first one. The second one, however, I would not, you can't put them in a box. You can't pretend they're going to disappear. They're geostrategic reality. Mm -hmm. We have to talk to the Russians, mm -hmm. but we have to know what to talk well, we about, talk to them who to we talk about, them. when to talk about. We have to be clever, because the Russians misinterpret some of our talking as, as kind of going along with them. A charm offensive will not right. work with Vladimir Putin. Corey Shockey. Yes and yes. Yes and yes. Fascinating. Thank you. Well, and my bottom Woody. line is we have to salvage our Western order under the leadership of the U.S. in order mm -hmm. to deal sensibly with Russia. Well, well said. With that, I want to thank German Ambassador Peter Wittig. So I hope you'll come back.